Commandant of the Marine Corps, General David Berger's planning guidance underscores the need for enterprise IT engineering and the importance of meeting peer competitors on a complex future battlefield. This future environment requires a unified network in which Marines can quickly transmit data for command and control purposes. Q, the Technical Management and Analysis Directorate, a team of technical experts tasked with modernizing the Marine Corps Enterprise Network, or MCSED. TMAD provides technical leadership and enterprise network configuration management to improve information environment operations for the Naval Force. They assess new or critical technologies and provide technical recommendations about network changes that can impact operations from the tactical edge to the supporting establishment. Today, I'm joined by the acting director of TMAD, Mr. Keegan Mills. Thank you for coming on the show, Keegan. Appreciate it, Trip. So to get started, can you share with us a bit about yourself and how you ended up on our acquisition team? Sure. Uh, as with life, everything is a, a little strange. Have you ever seen Mr. Holland's Opus? So I have. Are we going to be standing on this? Is that <laughs> no, the wrong different, movie? Different wrong movie, but uh, okay. but same kind of idea. Um, I, I did not intend to have a career in IT, but it just sort of happened. Uh, started when I was in high school, like in the mid-1990s. And evolved to the point where um, I ended up as the chief information officer of a defense contractor that happened to be acquisition focused. Uh, And it was, I I became a partner in that firm. The name of the company is Delta Resources. If anybody's listening that happens to know that company, it doesn't exist anymore. It was purchased in 2019. uh, And that's when I stepped away from from IT, kind of thinking I I, I hit it. Like I, I was the was the uh, CIO of a, of a mid-tier defense firm. I did pr- pretty good, right? Been there, done that, right. what's next? Awesome. Right. Um, so yeah, I was I was completely in left field looking at at, um, at UDC's aircraft maintenance program, maybe uh, thinking about becoming a, an A&P. And it was my my previous boss, the CEO of, that, of Delta Resources, that saw this job posting and said, hey, Keegan, this looks pretty cool. If you think you might want another stop on the uh, IT career train, you should take a look at it. And and I kind of put it off, kind of had it in my head that I was done, I was done with IT. But a little more prodding, and I, I applied to the job, and then started having conversations with uh, uh, Mr. Wilford, um, Mr. Stewart at the time, and General Pasagian. And, and I, I was I was convinced this was a place that I'd like to be. Were you disappointed that you wouldn't get to wear the uniform? That it would be <laughs> civilian clothing? I, not at all. No, I, I did have. Uh, and at one point in my past, I thought I, I might want to serve until I found out I was colorblind, and they don't let you do anything cool right. in a uniform if you're colorblind. So, uh, so there are I, reasons. I, yeah, for there that. are reasons right. for that. So, uh, <laughs> anyway, no, I was happy to wear a tie. Okay. So, for those of us that are a little less tech savvy, can you explain just you know what the McSen is and what role does it play in the Marine Corps? Absolutely. First of all, this is a very tech savvy workforce. Uh, so, so that isn't. Uh, um, it isn't something that I have to encounter on a regular basis. Part of my job is actually to be able to explain those technical things to, I don't want to say non-technical people, but uh, people whose job it is not to be in those weeds, but need to understand the implications of those things. So uh, I'm, I'm kind of comfortable uh, having those conversations, and, and I, I, I think I can get through to people, and I think we have good conversations about that. Um, the specific question about what is the McSend? Man, on General Pasagian's last day, or maybe it was a second to last day, uh, we were on the command deck and he asked me that question. Keegan, what is the McSen? Man, I had a lackluster answer for him. I just could not put it together. Uh, couldn't articulate what it was. Because I, I think part of it is it's in flux. And, and what we're after is changing kind of the fundamental definition of what the McSen and what net, the word network actually means. So uh, fundamentally what the McSen is, is at the, um, at the unclassified and up to the secret level, it's a vehicle to, uh, to move information, to move data, general purpose data amongst the Marine Corps and our partners and our coalition. Right now, I can tell you with a lot of fidelity, the pieces, the mechanics, the actual um, connectivity of the McSen, that that layer of it, one through three of the OSI model, if, you, if the listeners are familiar with that, um, we have detailed architectural drawings that's described in data that tells us the circuits, the switches, the routers, the firewalls, those things that make up the network. But what we're actually after is changing the definition of the network to we really don't care about those things uh, now and into the future. What we really care about is the identities of people and non-people, the people and things, 
and the resources that they're after, the data, the uh, the services, the applications that they're that they're trying to connect, and that that layer, all that mechanical layer, is is kind of interchangeable, or at least we want it to be. So the subject plus the resource equaling the network, that's what we're trying to get to with, with the mix end and with the word network. Either. Well, I think for a lot of us, uh, less, the less tech savvy like myself, I don't know what makes my car work, but I do recognize when it doesn't work. And so sure. so I think uh, with the mix end, I mean, there are times when when it's clear that things aren't hunky-dory Absolutely. with the mix end, this big air quote, the mix end thing. So. Sure, and there's a lot of people out there that are doing a lot of things to the mix end, which is actually one of the reasons that Task Force Aqua, the predecessor of TMAD, existed, is the mix end is has equity by so many people that it's owned by so many people. It's the entire Marine Corps. There is no program of record for the mix end, so there's no enterprise ownership of it. That's kind of what T TFA was established to. Uh, to provide. So about that. So you mentioned Task Force Aqua. So before there was a TMAD, there was a Task Force Aqua. And then, so how did that get started and how did that evolve into what we have now? Sure. Uh, it was really General Pasagian who had the uh, realization that he had a Marine Corps that was that is organized to solve problems at a fairly low echelon. The lower the echelon you can solve the problem, the more successful historically we, we are as an organization. When you take a concept like the network that can that that transcends all of the PORs, that transcends the, it is an enterprise construct, you need some sort of site picture that is at an altitude that is the enterprise that has all everyone's equity involved. So, so he stood up, his answer was a task force. There was a lot of task forces being stood up at that time. Uh, and, and his idea was, hey, let's put a task force together to, so that I can understand the mixen from the enterprise level and not just from, uh, say, a portfolio level or, or a macog level. So there, all these people have different missions that, um, that impact the mixen. They, they have their part, their role to play in the mixen. Um, and General Pasagi wanted to understand it holistically from an enterprise perspective, hence Task Force Aqua. Okay. And then how do we move from Task Force Aqua now to, to TMAD? Uh, it was General Pasagian's intent to institutionalize what was learned out of Task Force Aqua. So task forces, in generally speaking, are ephemeral. Uh, so you don't stand up a task force that endures forever. It mm -hmm. s stood up to solve a problem. And then, OK, what do we do with that? <clears throat> so his idea before he left was to transition that into a, an enduring directorate under the chief engineer's office to institutionalize the concept of, okay, now, now that we have established this enterprise view of the mix end, let's maintain that. Uh, let's return some of the, the analysis or the, the uh, assessment pieces that we kind of had organically through uh, McTissa. They go back to McTissa. We're still very connected with McTissa, but that uh, explicit link is no longer necessary. Okay. So, so now you've got TMAD and you have a team of people. So tell us a little bit about the team and sure. what is their role in modernizing the Mixen? The natural evolution from Task Force Aqua to TMAD is still sort of the same basic construct. I call it, there's there's three general areas that we, uh, that we can be bucketized into. We have the enterprise planners. And, and the way I describe those, those folks, uh, primarily, They've introduced themselves into the planning process for constituent technologies that will make up the future network. I know that was a, some, a bit of word salad. There was some buzzwords there. Was, there. Yeah, there was, there was some word salad there, but uh, effectively, here's a, a great example is IPv6. So the Department of Defense has an IPv6 strategy. The Department of Navy has an IPv6 strategy. The Marine Corps has an IPv6 strategy. Uh, our folks get involved with the planning of how we're going to implement these technologies uh, for a couple of reasons. One, to make sure that the Marine Corps equities are established in the plan of rolling out these, these fundamental technologies that the rest of the network is gonna be built upon. Because uh, our use case is different. Our use case is, uh, is a lot more nuanced and complex than, than some of the bigger players that are, are in there establishing that. So it's important to have that representation at the higher levels to make sure that is is when you say our use is that because we're 
often sandwiched between what the Navy's going to do and what the Army's going to do, or am I oversimplifying that, or have it completely wrong? No, no, you're 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 hitting you're hitting on something that's really important. It's it's our role in what we think the future battle space is going to look like, and I want to emphasize that because we really don't know what that future battle space is going to look like, and historically, you know, we haven't really gotten that right a lot of times. So what what we're doing is um, is establishing a capability that's that's uh, able to adapt to whatever the situation throws at us. So it's uh, and it's about building a deterrence to make sure that we we can manage that. We don't want to escalate into crisis and conflict. So how do we how do we develop a, a, a way to securely move data from anywhere to anywhere, and and not have that easily disruptable? That becomes a huge deterrence factor. If I want to take something like that on. I'm going to think twice about it. Right. A good, robust network. So, Absolutely. So when we talk about the TMAD, the directorate, we're not just talking about a five-person IPT making decisions, right? I mean, we're talking about multiple teams and uh, different people working on different stuff. Can you talk about the teams and roles and responsibilities? Sure, absolutely. We're, we're getting into the point now where the, uh, the methodology that we are working towards, experimentation, analysis, and assessment, uh, being kind of the core of our knowledge acquisition. Uh, and that, that's a fancy speak for we want a lab. We want a lab environment. We need a lab environment. Uh, one of the things about Task Force Aquila that was explicitly stated in the decision memorandum was the ability to assess changes to the mixen outside of the production environment. It is something that we have yet to achieve. So one of our Big goals, primary goals of TMAD is to get that Mixen lab established. It lines up with uh, the uh, Task Force NetMod goals, and it lines up with PEO digital goals, it lines up with Macaw goals, it lines up with McTissa goals. So we have this coalition that, that we have, uh, I don't want to say we're at the center of, but we're certainly a part of, uh, that, that Everyone agrees that we need this this concept, this concept and this construct in order to evolve the network faster. So you're right. It is a big coalition of people out there that are striving to make that a reality. Okay. Uh, so tell us about some of the task force's major accomplishments. What have you sure. knocked out of the park so far? I'd say the thing that we knocked out of the park was the question of um, configuration management and uh, architectural understanding of the McSen. We have... It's really the process is, is what I believe is, is valuable. I mean, the product is, is very valuable, but the process that, that our team has developed to maintain the architecture of the McSen in data is phenomenal. Our ability to answer questions about, like I said at the beginning, what the mechanical pieces of the McSen are, the switches, the routers, the firewalls, the circuits, the fiber, the ethernet, uh, we know to a very, very high degree of accuracy where that stuff is, what it is, when it was bought, under what contract, uh, the last time it was modified, the last time it was... I mean, we have so much data about those pieces that it is it is extremely impressive. Uh, and it's it's being used more and more um, across the enterprise for, for various things, which which I'm I'm very proud of of the team for being able to accomplish that. And also the I said before the the enterprise planning people that are involved in defining standards that are eventually going to become da the data tagging standards that are that are absolutely critical to getting to zero trust. Okay. Uh, the the IPv6 addressing standards, all the th all the planning that's gone on that now includes Marine Corps equities, that would not have happened without the Task Force Aquila team, now the team. Leading into team, team, team right. Correct. Okay. So let's say I'm an engineer inside a program office and I have to stand up a, a new weapon system. What role would TMAD have in that process and, and ability to help me out successfully? Sure. Right now, what we can do is describe the future of where the Department of the Navy and the Department of Defense is heading for future network architectures. So we can, we can give you that understanding of what the network topology is going to look like, what the architecture is going to look like, therefore what your systems are going to have to be capable of doing in order to take advantage or even participate in a, in a network construct, in a quote-unquote zero-trust style, style network. Uh, what we're building 
is the ability to show that. So this laboratory environment that we're putting together is as, as much a place for experimentation as it is for the analysis and the assessment. The experimentation allows us to effectively have show and tell. So I can, I can go to a portfolio manager or a program manager and say, here is what a zero trust network looks like. Look at it work. And here is, you can start extrapolating how, how your systems would be able to take advantage of that or even participate in that. Eventually, what, this, this, what we're after with this network, um, this, uh, this lab construct, is to be able to consume the artifacts produced in a digital engineering construct with the network as part of those artifacts. So all of the data that describes the network components can be used in the system of systems analysis, like a mission thread kind of analysis at a scale that we just can't do as people, like as, as linear, you know, do this event, then this event, then this event. We can start having a mission thread analysis happen in parallel at, at exponential scales that can do nuanced things to the, uh, the various systems and to the network and understand where that leads to problems and where we can build in some more resiliency and identify gaps. So I think you keep hinting at it and I'm gonna use a term that I hear. So the term is digital twin. So what is this digital sure. twin thing and, and what does it do for us? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna use, I'm gonna change that term a little bit uh, because digital twin, at least from the network perspective, is something that's probably uh, future horizon two or three. We have some steps to take before we can get there. And I'm, I'm being very literal with the, the twin, uh, the term twin, because when, when I say digital twin, what I want it to mean is the same code that produces the production environment is instantiated in a simulation environment. That's a twin. Uh, we're not quite there yet because we cannot, uh, we're, we're not fully describing our network in, in code. We're going to get there. That's part of the journey. But uh, what I'm I'm proposing as a first step is a digital sibling, um, and, and I I've, I've been asked why isn't it a, a digital, digital fraternal twin? <laughs> yeah, 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 no, not a digital cousin because of Patty Duke, right? That could anyway. Um, so um, so a digital a digital sibling essentially replicating the important pieces of the network architecture and the network capabilities. Going back to the, uh, the, the zero trust concepts of identity, uh, really focusing on the identity piece of the Mixen, what, what our personas are, both you and me as people, but also systems have identities. Being able to replicate that in, in uh, a, a way that looks like the Mixen so that we can, we can assess changes that we know are coming. For example, the, the Naval Identity Service is something we've been asked to participate in. Uh, and we need to be able to assess what that looks like on the network without actually changing our network. So we need that, we need that, um, that digital sibling of the Mixen in order, to, uh, in order to make it so. Eventually, that evolves to a digital twin of the mix end once it's described as code. And I'm getting to that future state that we just talked about where that is combined with the models that are resident in the Naval IME, for example, and all of that comes together to, to produce a product that, um, that will inform our ability to move forward, uh, not just with the network, but uh, uh, for Marine Corps Systems Command. We're talking about our identifying what we need to invest in for the future battle. So for me as a user, you want to be able to, to have this test bed where you can try out changes mm -hmm. so that you're not doing it on the live system so that I try to log in one morning only to discover something changed and that's I can't do a thing. That's precisely it. And one of the things that we have to be so careful with the changes that we do make to the mix end right now because we don't have that lab environment. We don't have the ability to, to make, especially the big muscle movements, and I, I'm going to go back to the Naval Identity Service, something that's as foundational to the Mixen as the identity. When you start messing with that, you really want to understand at a very deep level how that impacts everything that connects to it, how it breaks, how you're gonna fix it when it breaks. You really wanna be able to experiment with that at a level that you just can't do and be comfortable with on the live environment. 
Okay. Okay. I, I appreciate your helping me uh, understand some of, of that. Of course. You're talking about the digital twin. How is that different from, say, a sandbox? Sure. A, a sandbox is a little bit more generic. So I can have a sandbox that is a little bit like what I'm talking about with a digital sibling, where it is um, perhaps a room that has, think about it as a room that has the exact same equipment in it or the exact same stacks or even virtually has the same stacks as, uh, as your production environment. And, uh, and I can move those pieces around and experiment with it. A digital twin is, is actually taking, system in, systems engineers have, have this concept, is, is taking a, a virtual representation of a real world system and running it in a simulated environment. So, so those two concepts are kind of related, but the digital twin is, in a lot of cases, it is the production thing but it's being simulated in Microsoft Flight Simulator is what comes to mind when I think of digital twin because it kind of has a digital twin of, of physics and the earth and the real world. With no right? real consequences if we crash. Exactly. Right. That's, that's exactly it. Good, good deal. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for clearing that up. Sure. So Marines are not the only users of the McSen. Uh, so what is your relationship with uh, you know, other elements within the Department of the Navy mm -hmm. and what part do they play in the TMED? A big part of the group of people within TMAD are the enterprise planners. We've talked about them a few times. And uh, the mission is actually to be involved uh, with our external partners. So Department of the Navy for sure and also Department of Defense. Uh, we haven't really gone beyond DOD, but being involved in the modernization efforts at the bigger enterprise, and this goes into where do you define the enterprise? So uh, we've said, we've talked about the enterprise as a uh, from the McSen's point of view as a, as a Marine Corps construct, but uh, your question kind of opens up that door to talk about where we define the enterprise, and depending on what you're trying to do, the enterprise might be the Department of the Navy, it might be the DOD, it might be the whole of government, it might be in, to include our coalition partners. So just defining the enterprise is, is a struggle sometimes to figure out where that, where that line needs to be drawn. Uh, but we maintain uh, working group memberships at the Don level. A lot at the Don level goes on to define things like the Naval Identity Service and what that's going to look like. That's an enterprise service from the Don perspective, and they're looking at the Marine Corps as part of that enterprise. So we have to be in that room. We have to be representing what it is that the Marine Corps is going to need those things to do because, like I said before, the environment that we work in is is different. The environment that we, we live in in the map of, of what we think that battle space is is different. So we have to uh, we have to be in that room and help define those things. Right. I mean, we expect to be green in support of blue. Correct. And so why would that be any different in the digital space? So I, I get it. Thank yep. you. Thank yep. you. In many of the systems that we're talking about, I, I know that there are industry solutions that are tailored, you know, to work with the Mixen. But what is your relationship with our industry partners? And are there any opportunities for their expertise in this effort? So I came from industry. I spent most of my career uh, in, in industry. So I, I believe I have a pretty good relationship with, with a lot of people in industry. I do like to maintain um, regular contact with through some of the various channels we have. And I'd like to give a special shout out to uh, Luis Velazquez for his work in the CRADA facility that we have right outside the base and his uh, just tireless effort to, to keep us connected with uh, with our industry partners and uh, the organization that he does for uh, you know for his tech talks and, and the things that he he hosts over there I, I I don't get over there enough but when I do it's it's always amazing to see what industry is bringing to the table I will say we have a role to play that I think we can do a better job in defining our needs and our expectations of how some of some of these concepts need to be able to survive in the future battle space. Uh, and that's hard to do because a lot of that is threat informed and a lot of that is classified at a fairly high level. There's plenty of contractors out there that have that ability to consume that information. We just need to make sure we do a better job of informing, informing industry of those types, those pieces of the requirements so that they can incorporate that into what they come 
come back to us with. And we have to be able to listen to some imagine, imagination and some ideas uh, and, and perhaps have some uncomfortable conver conversations about our, our requirements that we're imposing through things like RMF that might, might have a, a, an unintended consequence and it might be hindering industry from giving us the answer that would be most valuable. It is, does industry have advantages over us in how they manage their networks uh, that maybe we could, I don't know, try to pirate some of their ideas or what? They certainly have a much more freedom to implement things. Uh, and I don't want to say fail faster because the, the fail part isn't really the point. Learn faster. Um, <clears throat> But also the consequences for failure uh, on the industry side are, are nowhere near what our consequences are. So um, I think there's room for us to learn from industry, but I don't think we could replicate what they do because the consequences of getting it wrong for us is a little bit, well, it's a lot different. Right, very different. Very different. Right, right. It's, it's more than dollars and cents on our end. Correct. Not that we don't care about the dollars and cents. Sure. But, but more than that. So. so the Commandant has emphasized the need to meet peer competitors on a complex future, future battlefield. How do you think that uh, the Tactical Management and Analysis Directorate is supporting the Commandant's vision? This is something that I think about a lot. Um, I have several documents on my desktop that, uh, that are kind of my check. Like, well, what am I doing to support these bigger, bigger visions? And if I can't answer those, then I need to check what, what I'm doing. But uh, I, I want to go back to a, an event, a sea air space this year. I was, I was at a Force Design 2030 uh, roundtable. And on the stage was ACMAC, DC, CD, and I, Commander of Marine Corps Systems Command, and Sergeant Major Black. And Sergeant Major Black's introduction was probably the most compelling and uh, just the best description of what it was, the, the, what the vision is, what, what is it that we're after. Uh, and he reminded everybody in the room that Force Design 2030 was not a standalone product. It is a third of the Commandant's vision of, of the Marine Corps of 2030. There's Talent Management 2030 and there's Training and Education 2030. Those last two are, are really 100% about people. Right, so him being from MNRA, he, he, he summed it up like this. Um, it's about putting the right Marine at the right place at the right time. Now, I'm gonna add something to that because of Marine Corps Systems Command, with the right stuff. That's kind of our mission here, right? Now, add MCDP-8 to that and you've established information as a war fighting function. So what are we trying to do? We are trying to securely move. This is the this is just uh, recently released uh, capstone design concept from Don CIO. We are trying to securely move information from anywhere to anywhere. So what am I trying? Information is in a that, timely fashion. It's that stuff, right. right? So I'm trying to make sure that stuff, that data, that information is with the right marine at the right place at the right time. Man, that's that to me is squarely in what the commandant's after. Right, excellent. All right, so you've described a bit to us where TMAD came from, where TMAD is. What's the future for TMAD? Where do we go from here? Let me put my futurist hat on here. Okay, imagine, imagine we're a few years into the future and, uh, and we've, we've established the lab. That, is, that construct is up and running. Uh, we're on our way down this digital transformation, digital engineering, digital transformation path, and, and we have uh, some percentage of our tactical systems are, are described in models and, and live in a, in a naval IME and this, everything is a common standard, including the network, the McSend. Um, and what we're able to do at that point is start mission threat analysis with the network as a foundational piece of the mission threads. And we can, at scale, start tweaking the individual components that make up the systems and that make up the network and do that a hundred times, a thousand times, a million times. All the little things that make up the, those systems are described in models and you can do that and you can do that at a scale and, and you start to identify dependencies 
and you start to identify gaps where things might not be as resilient as we thought they are. And, and then we use that information to inform future investment. And if that sounds like what we currently do, it is. It's, it's the operating system of the Marine Corps. It's just at, at machine scale. Okay, excellent. Well, I, I have to tell you, I, I've learned a lot from you. Cool. I'm hoping that uh, the listeners, listeners uh, learn a lot as well. And uh, I appreciate your coming on the show today. I truly enjoyed the conversation. So we have a couple questions for you that we like to ask, our, our lightning round question. Uh, uh, for those that listened last season, we have swapped out most of the questions, and so you'll be the first person first. to respond to our new lightning round questions. Are you ready? Hit me. All right. So when you were a child, what did you want to be when you grew up? Okay, the first thing I wanted to be when I grew up was Santa Claus, according to my parents. I don't remember that one, but I'm told Santa Claus. Then garbage truck driver. I wanted to drive the truck. I want to make sure that's clear. Not be the can guy, the driver. I wanted driver. to drive the guy. I was fascinated with the garbage truck. I loved it when they came by in the morning. Uh, helicopter pilot and meteorologist. When I got a little bit older, I wanted to be a rock star and uh, and then a myth buster. Well, I mean, myth bustering is probably the closest that, that you've ended up of that list. Yeah, it's still not a myth buster, though. I think they had the coolest jobs ever. So, yeah, I, I enjoyed a lot of myth busters episodes, so... If you could have dinner with any historical figure, who would it be? So I thought about that one. I think it's Thucydides. Thucydides? Yes, okay. and I'm very interested in, in how we can avoid his little trap. Go on. <laughs> oh, you want to hear this? Go on. I, I just, I, I believe uh, we're, this great power competition that we're in right now is uh, uh, an exercise in the Thucydian trap. And uh, I, I'm cautiously optimistic that we are going to be uh, for the third time uh, a player in avoiding that trap um, of of the 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 overtaking and the overtaken uh, world power um, you know avoiding that fight that conflict you know for a long time it was it was a pretty much done deal that the overtaking and the overtaken we're gonna fight um, but in in two of the last four examples of of the Thucydian trap being avoided, uh, the United States was was part of that. Uh, so I, I think we have we have reason to hope that we can uh, we can continue that tradition. All right, and still holding strong. And so. still holding strong. All right. So, do you have any tips for for listeners for working to uh, maintain a work life balance? Yeah. Don't think of the balance as, as as a steady state. Sometimes it's going to tip towards one side or the other, and that's okay, as long as it evens out to your specific tolerances. And your tolerances are also dynamic. They, they can change. Uh, and then the other piece of that is, is if it's not working out for you, make a change. It's great advice. Great advice. What is a TV show, book, movie, or a podcast that you would recommend to our listeners? Well, I think this is a trick question because I have to recommend uh, equipping our Marines. So, um, well, we appreciate the, yes, uh, the, the shout out. The, the shout out. But in addition, I, I will say there is a. I would like to give a plug to a, a TV show that I recently found uh, called Detectorists. And uh, Detectorists are those who operate metal detectors. Okay. Uh, it's a it's a British uh, pseudo comedy, and the antagonists are. Um, lookalikes for Simon and Garfunkel and hilarity ensues. All right. Well, that one I will need to check out. So, well, again, I, we appreciate you coming on, sure. uh, answering all my questions and just having a great conversation today, Keegan. I appreciate it. Trip, it was a pleasure. All right. Thank you. Well, this concludes another episode of Equipping the Corps. I hope you've enjoyed our conversation today. If so, please take a couple minutes to leave us a review, subscribe, and tell your friends about us. Until next time, Stay safe. This is Trip Elliott signing off.